literally sits on the levee uh, built land of Lake Pontchartrain. So we're not over here on the riverfront. Um, I'm in the planning and urban studies department there, uh, where I've been for about a year and a half now. And so I'm happy to uh, kind of adopt my home of New Orleans, but I am not a Louisiana native. I'm from Jersey. And so uh, the presentation earlier uh, is somewhat of a kind of marrying the two worlds um, of which I, I somehow live in. So one of the presentations, um, we really are, I was going to say just blessed, to have a, um, an illustrious panel of scholars, researchers, activists, and practitioners in a number of different fields who are with us today to share their thoughts on, yes, the title, evacuation, eviction, and immigration, but from a much wider time, space lens, uh, then the conversations typically take place here within the city of New Orleans and its surrounding areas. Mo like most cities right now, the city of New Orleans is in the midst of an affordability crisis and that is making much of the conversations about uh, shelter in relationship to storms uh, being about the kind of existential crisis of those being quote unquote displaced and those being quote unquote replaced. Um, but what uh, this panel offers us an opportunity to do is think a lot more uh, conceptually about what does it mean to be settled and what does it mean to be uh, in migration from that place of settlement, that place to which you feel belonging. And I think that it was very apropos that our panelists for the first uh, part of the day really laid out the reality of our um, lack of placidness here in this particular site right now in the fact that we are one of many collectives of individuals who have been here felt a, a uh, belonging here in this particular square footage of site. Prior to us, our antecedents are many. Uh, they are slaves and slave owners. They are native populations and the um, colonialists that forced them into, yes, the hinterlands of the bayous um, and wetlands throughout um, the southeastern United States and beyond. And so, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our, uh, our panelists for today. We have uh, Jay Arena, who's lived and worked as a community and labor organizer in New Orleans for over 20 years. And he's the author of Driven from New Orleans, How Nonprofits Betray Public Housing and Promote Privatization. He is currently an associate professor of sociology at um, the College of University of New York, CUNY's College of Staten Island, and is now writing a book on the contending movements to privatize and defend public <coughs> schools in Newark, New Jersey. <coughs> Dr. Yes. Dr. Monica Ferris is in the middle there, uh, is an associate professor of research and the director of the um, UNO Center for Hazardous Assessment, Response, and Technology, CHART, one of our sponsors today. Her current applied research includes the examination of local repetitive flood loss data to assist communities in the identification of appropriate mitigation strategies, hazard mitigation planning, implementation of the community rating system, and education and outreach focused on disaster resilience. Dr. Ferris has published on the subject of building capacity for disaster resilience and has presented multiple times on risk reduction and disaster planning. Next to her, we have Farah Cambris, who is an assistant professor in the Division of Social Work, Behavioral and Political Sciences at Prairie View A&M University. Her research interests include race, class, community building, and disaster. Her research on Hurricane Katrina has resulted in several peer-reviewed publications in the Journal of Black Studies, the Journal of Global Policy and Resilience, and the Journal of Urban History. 
And she's also done quite a bit of research here um, in New Orleans, and so some people actually might just mistake her for a local. Uh, Angelica Morris serves as executive director of Housing NOLA, the nonprofit responsible for New Orleans' 10 year housing strategy and implementation plan. Housing NOLA offers a roadmap to ensure that strategic choices are made to address inequity issues in housing. Last year, Gambit Weekly named her New Orleanian of the Year uh, because of her role in Housing NOLA's historic efforts to create 33,000 affordable housing opportunities to end the city's housing crisis. And as a respondent to presentations from the four of these individuals, we have Zaire Dizzy Flores, uh, who's an assistant professor of sociology and Latino Caribbean studies at Rutgers University. Her research investigates race and class inequality as mediated by the built environment. She's the author of Locked In, Locked Out, Gated Communities in a Puerto Rican City, winner of the American Sociological Association's 2014 Robert E. Park Award. Current projects include an examination of racial aesthetics in the real estate market, a project on the global circuits of planning ideas, an audiovisual project on Caribbean technicians of place, and a collaboration examining mobile, mobile segregation. And lastly, I'll add that myself, um, I am someone who does research on um, both chronic and acute risk to the built environment and the communities that it houses. <coughs> and currently, my research is focused on um, post-war constructions that disproportionately house people of color and their businesses. And I've done research previously and published previously on um, particularly the, that, the building stock of railroad companies and how the bankruptcy of the companies created a disaster for the communities around which uh, rail transportation was so vital, both to just their um, everyday livelihoods, but also to the, um, the ability for those communities to become much more racially and economically integrated through a uh, combination of people who were more transit dependent as well as those who were served by the highway system. And so I'm happy to uh, speak with people on this panel who have an understanding of disaster that is broader than just the one storm. Um, and we're going to be talking today more in, as through their presentations about that, um, that temporality, that continuity of crisis that people are experiencing and the ways in which it's being addressed and exasperated. And so we'll first have Jay. University for this uh, for this facility. I think we got a tax write-off. 
Now, Cannizzaro arrives in New Orleans in the mid-1960s after dealing with some issues in Mobile uh, and to make his mark on in real estate. And that is at the same time that uh, the fire industry, um, tourism, begins to go into ascendancy and becomes the dominant political, economic, and cultural force uh, in, in the city, in many cities uh, around the country. Uh, and they use, uh, and their kind of definition of development becomes hegemonic. And they use their power to, to, to marginalize uh, and drive out politically and physically uh, industrial capital. And as opposed to industrial capital, their focus is driving up real estate values, driving up property values above all, as well as containing and exploiting labor, but at times expelling labor, not wanting to exploit it, but to expel it altogether. And the local state, what Sam Stein in a great, excellent book just out, uh, Capital, uh, The Capital State, um, focuses on the role of the real estate state, particularly the local state, is crucial in driving up those land values, in carrying out uh, what Adolph Reed calls a rent intensification agenda. And I think that's a, a, a more useful term than gentrification, which makes it appear that this is just an inevitable, uh, uh, uncontrollable process, whereas rent intensification focuses on the political and economic actors the, and their, their decisions that they carry out to drive up uh, to drive up property property values, um, and so this is not an inevitable process, and it is at the heart of it is displacement and the dispossession of working class people. Now the local state. In New Orleans, when uh, Canadero <coughs> arrives, uh, is being um, is being led by a, a, a black led. It is a transformation of a black led state, what Adolf Reed calls the black urban regime, and they were uh, ready and eager to carry out that rent intensification agenda to assist in that. Uh, I interviewed, as part of my research, James Singleton, who is the longtime uh, city councilman uh, from this area. Uh, and he was actually very proud to talk about the efforts that the local state had taken to help increase the, the values, of, particularly in this area where Canizero invested, in which Canizero was, well, knew well Mr. Singleton. Um, things like closing down single room occupancy, hotel zoning changes around that, multifamily housing, the, the World's Fair, the, the HUD subsidies, direct, supposed to be for low-income people, that were used for the, the World's Fair, which part of it came, became the, the first part of the convention center, and helped the transition from light industrial to fire use here in the warehouse district. Um, uh, and so they were really, the, the, the local state was, was central uh, to, to all of that. And then a particular target for the rent intensification agenda was removing the impediment of public housing. Uh, that was a top priority. And people like Canizero, Cavacaw, other members of the fire capitalists. I just had a discussion with a member of a, a future panel of a, a meeting that was held in the mid-90s by Cavacaw with local architects on how we can uh, remove this impediment to the rent intensification agenda. Uh, and the, let me get to some, I'm not good on the PowerPoints. These aren't as fancy as some of the other folks, but this is the area, the general area, the MICO track. We're somewhere in there. Um, uh, but the local state was very central to help carry out the attack on, on public housing. And this is a, a photograph uh, from 1988, after the uh, Bartholomew administration had released the Roshan Report, which was a plan to massively downsize the public housing in the city, particularly going after the St. Thomas and the Iverville, which were in the center of the, uh, the rent intensification agenda. Um, and as you can see, it was not well received. This is Jim, the late Jim Hayes. Um, uh, and, there, and this was defeated, so there is potential to resist this agenda as well. It was put on the back burner for a few years, but later, because of the assistance at the national level, the real estate state in the form of the, the, uh, the Clinton administration, the Hope Six agenda, eliminating the one for one rule, that assisted in the, uh, the eventual uh, demolition of the St. Thomas. This is all pre-Katrina. Pre -Katrina. Katrina. It's hard to say that word, right? It gets you scary talking about <laughs> Katrina. Um, but also in assisting in this agenda, and this kind of up, came up with the other panels, 
was the philanthropic funded nonprofit complex, which interestingly enough, considering who was targeted for this, kind of was the promoter of a, of a self-determination anti-racist ide ideology that helped take residents away from direct action and resisting the displacement, kind of into these insider negotiations that facilit facilitated uh, the expulsion of the residents. And, and as well, we have to look at the role of my discipline, the role of sociology, and this whole theory of deconcentrating poverty, which really goes into ascendancy in the 1990s, and the propagators, the sociologists that propagated that, as uh, public housing became a free fire zone for the fire capitalists at that time. Now, I know I don't have much time do I have. I was trying to cut this short a little bit. Um, but I'm doing okay. So post-Katrina, um, we kind of know that story, right? Uh, Canizera uh, talks about, and other uh, uh, cap fire capitalists talk about a clean slate, right? That they have a clean sheet, uh, as they say, to do what you want uh, in, in New Orleans. And uh, they, we, they carried out a massive um, privatization against public housing, public schools, the public hospital, um, opening up those properties to the fire industry, driving out the people that relied on those, the organized labor and power, working class power that was embedded in those public services. Um, we saw that the, the road home program, right, facilitated fun funding um, homeowners, particularly more affluent homeowners, where the overwhelming majority renters were left out altogether. Uh, we had the green spacing plan of the Bring New Orleans Black Commission, which did, they did have to step back because of the resistance of that. But there was kind of a combination of the iron fist and the velvet glove um, to undertake um, these attacks. And I think these can be, um, are crystallized in the attack on the Lafitte public housing development, which an architect, uh, uh, Orishev, called its destruction a human and architectural tragedy of vast proportions. It was built in the late 30s, early 40s by Creole artisans uh, in the Treme area. But with the assistance of the, well there was, there was police actions like this depicted here, we have a, one of our guests, Mike Cowles, was there uh, in a direct action reoccupation of the development and then the police forces hauled people out. Uh, and this was the final um, end of the uh, Lafitte development. But there was also consensual mechanisms. So if you had outfits like Providence Community um, Housing, part of the Archdiocese of New Orleans, funded by philanthropic outfits, um, the local priest in the neighborhood, uh, Father Jacques, Leah Chase, the restaurateur, um, and they're kind of what Michelle Boyd calls a, a Jim Crow nostalgia ideology which portrayed the redevelopment as a recovering of an authentic, um, uh, uh, self-directed, self-reliant black culture that had been uh, decimated by a culture of poverty promoting welfare state. So that helped kind of legitimate kind of part of the consensual mechanisms, the actors and the ideologies that were also important post-Katrina. And then at the national level, you had the National Low Income Housing Coalition led by Sheila Crowley uh, legitimating this whole attack and putting uh, local activists right within the framework that was acceptable to, to fire, working with the low-income tax credits and such. Um, but it is important to remember there was resistance to this agenda, and that was very important in unmasking the attempt to pray that, portray this as a consensual process, welcome, <coughs> commonsensical. Uh, it unmasked uh, it showed the deeply authoritarian nature, anti-democratic nature of the master planning uh, that was carried out by the local and national state and their fire, their fire allies. So that was very important. And but the even more important was that the uh, that this resistance and the public housing movement was maybe the most uh, most significant. They didn't just fight against these attacks, right? Uh, against this master, the, the planning by the masters. But they also put forward their own program, right? Uh, not in these phony planning sessions that were going on uh, post-Katrina, but they planned out what they wanted. What was the world that they were fighting for? Uh, and so uh, this is a, a march on the first Martin Luther King Day 
after Katrina, after the city uh, under the Nagan administration had abandoned the, the uh, historical starting point of the Lower Ninth Ward, which was to send a message that the Ninth Ward was not going to be rebuilt. But they were fighting to bring everybody home through a mass, democratically controlled um, public works and public services program to rebuild New Orleans, rebuild the Gulf Coast. That was their planning agenda. Uh, finance, and that was also brought up by taxing the wealth and income of the billionaires and millionaires and also ending their war machine. Um, and we see that that, has, that played a part, right, in helping um, uh, get on the political agenda the demand for a, a massive Green New Deal. And so when we evaluate social movements, it's important to look at the time frame, right? Uh, that's one of the successes of that movement. Although public housing was lost, that helped get on the political agenda with the, the struggles of others, the Howie Hawkins campaign, and that's helped lay the groundwork for people like AOC to put this on the agenda. And we do see s some movement in that, in that direction. We, some of the work of the Jacobin. We have one of our guests, Daniel Aldana Cohen. I think that was an important work that he just published on the, the need to put public housing as a central part of the Green New Deal to address climate change and growing inequality. And that's real success. I mean, talking about public housing had been verboten, right? It had been demonized. And that is the returning to the political agenda. Um, uh, but, you know, so we call for that, uh, that that's got to be a central part. But I think, and I'll end right here, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. I think we need to look critically on how this is going to be carried out, right? Uh, the Democratic Party, which the, the, the current advocates of the Green New Deal are working through, is more dominated by the fire industry than even the Republican Party. So I think if we're really going to seriously make advances on winning a, a, a real Green New Deal that we understand, a direct government, public service, public jobs program, where that movement is going to have to have their own democratically controlled electoral arm in order to make advances uh, in that direction. Thanks a lot. Monica Farris with UNO Chart. My <coughs> comments um, this morning will focus on some recently completed work by Chart on evacuation plan here in the city of New Orleans. Just one slide on who we are. We're an applied social science hazards research center that partners with and supports Louisiana communities in efforts to achieve disaster resilience with a focus on mitigation. Here are just a few pictures of faculty, staff, and students that represent departments across our campus, political science, urban studies, planning, engineering, sociology, depending on the nature of the project, really dictates who we, we go to for certain projects. Chart is actually also part of the planning and urban studies department at the University of New Orleans. Some of you may know stats by heart, they may have been mentioned here this morning. Approximately 1.5 million people evacuated before Hurricane Katrina made landfall on August 29, 2005. At the same time, an estimated 150,000 to 200,000 individuals remained during the storm. Some chose to stay, while others did not have the opportunity to evacuate due to lack of resources. Following Katrina, the City of New Orleans developed what's known as the City Assisted Evacuation Plan in an effort to address gaps in emergency preparedness and planning, especially for the city's most vulnerable. Very generally, if you don't know, um, the plan is a coordinated effort of the City of New Orleans and the Regional Transit Authority, the RTA, where there are 17 pickup points or evacuee spots, and you see that picture of the, the metal guy kind of looks like a tailing cab, that's an evacuee spot, and they're located throughout the city. 
Um, and in the event the mayor calls for a mandatory evacuation, people will be able to go to these evacuation spots, these points, and be brought to a central location by the RTA, <coughs> where they will be picked up by yet another set of buses sent by the state and brought out of the risk area to various shelters. The plan is heavily dependent on a group of volunteers called Evacuteer. The plan was actually activated for Hurricane Gustav in 2008, and about 20,000 residents participated in the city-assisted evacuation. UNOCHAR did conduct a study shortly after, where they talked to about 364 people who did utilize the plan. Surprisingly, maybe, to many of you, almost three-fourths were satisfied with the experience. Over half rated the experience as good or better. But of course, many challenges were noted through that survey process. Miscommunications, negative experiences in the shelters, concern over the return process, lack of confidence in our government, to name a few of those challenges. As research shows, disasters dis disproportionately affect vulnerable populations. And the fact that the city estimates that between 35 and 40,000 people may need help evacuating before the next major hurricane, the city applied for funding in 2015 from the Federal Transit Administration to evaluate the evacuation plan. The project team included the city, the RTA, and UNM chart, and Evacuteer also played an important role in the study. Specifically, the focus of the project was to answer these two questions. What can be done to better serve the vulnerable populations to ensure that no person or group is left out of the process? And how can technology and risk communication practices serve community members who are often overlooked? The project funding allowed the team to do a lot. Um, I'm going to focus today on the results of community mapping exercise we did in terms of vulnerable populations and these evacuee spots. Um, we were also able to plan and implement a tabletop and a full-scale exercise of the plan and to conduct interviews and focus groups of local nonprofits that work with vulnerable populations, those who are registered with the city's special needs registry and individuals who use the city-assisted evac evacuation process in the past. Findings produced a lot of qualitative data regarding the city-assisted evacuation process. These data were coded and, the and themes emerged um, as we analyzed the data uh, regarding positive issues as well as opportunities for improvement. Our recommendations follow sort of these categories or these themes <coughs> listed on this slide, which also inform many of the when, why, and how questions related to evacuation. The decision to evacuate is a continual process for individuals and families. Many factors can impact that decision process. Beyond the geographic and physical vulnerabilities that of course we discussed earlier this morning, and many were discussed during the, um, the course of our project and data collection. Each of the following slides, or six, corresponding with the themes I just showed, um, reveal examples of quotes from the interviews, focus groups, um, and the recommendations made were based on the data collected, again, organized by these categories. And I'll begin with the positive. Um, many stakeholders did describe positive experiences with the RTA and the evacuation planning process. Recommendations were uh, made to continue the special needs registry, to, to continue the RTA special, lift services, and to continue the plan as it, as it um, was pr um, presented. While positive comments were made, other stakeholders did not know or knew very little about the process itself. Recommendations were made regarding the addition of signage at the evacuee spots, which I think signs have been added to the, many of those spots, those statues. Implementing a variety of outreach methods to target different stakeholder groups, and developing materials in plain language, and making them more accessible for all populations with disabilities. When it comes to evacuation, it's important to understand where vulnerabilities <coughs> exist in the community and where concentrations of these vulnerable populations may be. Our GIS analysis, as well as interviews and focus group data, reveal issues with the evacuation spots themselves, with the location of those, those um, metal statues. 
um, in relation to where the vulnerable populations actually exist. Overall, many of the Iraqi spots are not optimally located. Multiple ones are located in areas with marginal amounts of vulnerable population, while others with high degrees of social vulnerability have minimal or no Iraqi spots. And I don't know how well you can see this map, but let's see, in the top right of the map where you can see, I guess it's sort of coming out to be like mustard color, green color, New Orleans East, Gentilly, um, there's only two spots for that entire area. And um, if you're interested in seeing this data, we have several maps like this, and the report is available online, and I'll be glad to show it to you later, because I know it's hard to see with the light. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to gloss over. So recommendations here based on this analysis um, include further analysis of the spots in terms of social vulnerability, um, the addition of evacuee spots and or shuttle service to make sure people do have access to the ones that do exist, the relocation potentially of evacuee spots to improve walking distances for evacuees, and to improve the accessibility of the actual evacuee spots for residents with disabilities. And again, um, I don't know if you can see, there's little yellow dotted lines around each one. Those are half mile buffers to give you an idea of how far you would have to walk. And a half mile is pretty far, especially for someone who has a disability. So again, just to kind of give you an idea of what we were looking at. Some respondents expressed frustration with the non-disaster everyday RTA and paratransit services offered in the city. Problems were emphasized when asked about their experiences during Katrina and Gustav. Many respondents pointed out the need for shelters to be designed for specific disabilities. Some discussed the uncertainty about where they would go in the event of an evacuation, as well as distrust of the city's plan overall, which of course could prevent many of the city's most vulnerable from leaving um, a dangerous situation. Others revealed the name of the special needs registry that the city does have might deter residents from signing up or understanding that they should sign up for the registry before the event occurs. Still others emphasize the need for confidentiality when discussing health issues during the overall process. Our next theme, integrating cultural competencies into the plan. Through our discussions, issues of the language emerged. Many respondents in the Vietnamese and Latino communities stated that there was a not enough information about the actual plan in other languages. They also expressed the need for more translators to be involved in the process itself. Beyond language, participants explained that the undocumented community is hesitant to go to the central pickup point, which currently is the, um, the Union Passenger Terminal, which I, I believe there are discussions about moving that central location at this point. I don't know if anybody's here with the city, but I've heard that. Um, but fearing that these undocumented um, members of the community could be detained or harassed by immigration officials. The interviewees also explained that there are many day laborers that act as first responders and rebuilders in the event of a, of a hurricane, such as Katrina, and do not plan to evacuate the city, preferring to stay behind and work. The final theme, trust. Residents' distrust in the city and the CAE, or the City Assisted Evacuation Process, often cause them to rely on their own resources during the disaster. Some residents feel attached to their homes and their neighborhoods and do not want to leave. Residents that recently relocated because of a disaster um, to stable housing are less likely to leave now because they're afraid they would not be able to return. Some express distrust or uncertainty surrounding the transportation of pets and service animals. Additionally, advocates for immigrant and Latino communities repeatedly brought up concerns about evacuating people without documents, as there were difficulties in the past with documents and shelters. As undocumented immigrants also face increased state and federal scrutiny, many community members say that many will not evacuate if there are no sanctuary shelters designated. Um, so following our report, completed in 2017, I should mention, that the city has um, taken many steps to address the recommendations, um, the opportunities that were brought up in the report. It's developed an updated communications plan. It's revised its website quite a bit. More plain language, more actionable steps that can be taken in preparedness. 
um, videos like the one here um, explaining the, um, the city assisted evacuation process and how to prepare to participate in it um, and many other materials written in other languages um, that the city hopes will provide people with additional information to make that an important decision around evacuation. And that's where I'll end. primarily by Hurricane Katrina. So I want to kind of take you back a little bit. So for from um, 2005 to 2014 when I um, left New Orleans, I worked on three, three projects. This is not my original PowerPoint, so I'm sorry. I worked on three projects that were Katrina related. The first project was my dissertation research focused on community building and Pontchartrain Park. Um, in 20, uh, 2005, I had this idea that I'd write this dissertation on um, how residents in Pontchartrain Park um, built their community or created community solidarity through the use of their organizations and their community institutions. Well, in August of uh, 2005, I had conducted two interviews with residents and the month before that, I had done several observations in the community only to have to evacuate the city like the residents of Pontchartrain Park. So as you can imagine, um, after leaving uh, New Orleans like many residents did, I was completely at a loss. I did not know what was going to happen to my research. Um, but by the time I came back to New Orleans in January of 2006 after being evacuated and living in Mississippi, um, I saw that residents were coming back and that it would be worthwhile to examine how the, these residents rebuilt their community in the aftermath of disaster. So that was my first project. And so that was my dissertation research that started um, in 2005 and ended in 2008. But by the time that project ended, I was invited to be a part of the Ultra X project which was a group of scholars from Tulane, University of New Orleans, and um, also Xavier University, where I worked at the time. And what we wanted to do is kind of compare the recovery of three neighborhoods or three areas in New Orleans. So I was invited to be a part of the project because I worked in Pontchartrain Park, but we also looked at the Lower Ninth, which Josh actually worked on this project with us. And we looked at, um, um, what was it? Uh, Holly Grove, and that was also kind of, um, or the advance kind of conducted those um, observations in Holly Grove. So that was another project. So that was from about 2008 until 2011. So by this time, I am Katrina wiped out, and I'm tired of talking about and researching Katrina. However, <laughs> I had other unanswered questions because. By this time, I was a full-time faculty member at Xavier University working uh, with students on a daily basis, many of whom had been children at the time that Hurricane Katrina made landfall in New Orleans. So for me, I really wanted to understand, and I still have these lingering questions of what it was like to come of age in a post-disaster context. Several of the students that I mentored at Xavier were actually um, in the process of becoming emerging adults, this demographic between 18 to 25 where you're trying to figure out your life and you know the transition to adulthood has kind of been extended. So you're, it, you're trying to get credentials for education or you're starting your career paths. And I wanted to understand how all of that had been influenced or if it had been influenced by being a youth in the post Katrina um, context. So that was the third project. But today, in thinking about those three projects, 
I think that I would like us to consider race, class, and social vulnerability in our discussion broadly. So initially, New Orleans black middle class did not receive much media or scholarly attention in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. The city's problems with crime, substandard housing, poverty, and a decaying public school system often overshadowed the fact that New Orleans was home to a thriving middle class with strong roots in the New Orleans community. Not only did the city's social circles and organizations reflect the presence of a black middle class, but local HBCUs such as Xavier, Dillard, and Southern University of New Orleans had long produced black graduates who would eventually become part of the black middle class, at least that is if we define middle class by education or use education in our definition of middle class. At the time of Hurricane Katrina, there were several identifiable black middle class enclaves in eastern New Orleans and Gentilly. I carried out my research in Pontchartrain Park, or the Pontchartrain Park neighborhood. The neighborhood was marketed as a suburban style subdivision that would provide home ownership opportunities for the city's postal workers, teachers, and longshoremen. And although the original residents who moved to the neighborhood in the 1950s and 1960s were considered middle class, they were economically vulnerable. Racism and discrimination stifled the socioeconomic positioning of blacks, even black middle class. Consistently, researchers have demonstrated that when compared to white middle class Americans, black middle class Americans are financially vulnerable, and that members of the black middle class often have less wealth and assets than their white middle class counterparts and are more likely to live in segregated spaces. Pontchartrain Park and its black middle class residents suffered in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. High levels of flood water devastated the na their neighborhood homes, and <clears throat> a discriminatory road home program hampered the pace of the neighborhood's recovery. Majority black neighborhoods like Pontchartrain Park were more likely to have lower pre-storm values than white middle class neighborhoods, and the road home program used those values to calculate grant amounts. Most of the road home grants awarded to Pontchartrain Park homeowners were between $40,000 and $65,000, whereas white middle class neighborhoods like Lakeview received grants ranging from $115,000 $115, to $150,000. The disparity in grant amounts demonstrate the financial cost of residential segregation for African Americans. And I don't know if So this is just a pre-Katrina, this is when I left Katrina in that August, this is what the neighborhood looked like, and this is the neighborhood I was studying, and then when I came back, this is what the, the neighborhood looked like. I didn't keep a lot of pictures from Katrina, so I, didn't, I wasn't able to dig up a lot. Um, so in the years, seven years after Katrina, I still had questions about the recovery. I was curious about what happened to black youth who left New Orleans, but ultimately returned to New Orleans months, after, months or years after Katrina. The individuals in my study were between the ages of 12 and 17 when Hurricane Katrina made landfall. After seven years, they described memories of leaving and returning home. These memories were still etched in their minds. In the years after Hurricane Katrina, researchers from the Greater New Orleans Data Center observed a gradual emergence of more knowledge-based jobs, such as those in higher education, legal services, and insurance. By 2009, jobs in higher education surpassed shipbuilding, heavy construction, and engineering to become the fourth largest economic driver in the metropolitan area. The rate of entrepreneurship also increased significantly in the years after Hurricane Katrina. In the aftermath of Katrina, New Orleans had been, was becoming a place for startups. From 2010 to 2012, about 501 out of every 100,000 adults started up a business annually in New Orleans, and this rate was nearly 60% higher than the national average. So at this time, when I'm doing my research, it looks like New Orleans had become this new New Orleans, a new place filled with opportunities for everyone. However, my respondents to my research painted a different picture, and their voices told me different things. 
The signs of growth in the new New Orleans did not have a positive economic impact on all groups. In the new New Orleans, African Amer American men were still underrepresented, underrepresented significantly in some of the better paying and faster growing industries. Emerging adults in my research described Coast Katrina, New Orleans, as a place that had failed to meet their educational and employment needs. Finally, I feel like my research really tapped into the social psychological burdens of leaving and wanting to return to a city that had been devastated by flooding, no matter what the cost might be. My research participants described a longing for a space, community, rituals, and culture, and wanting to return home, no matter how damaged the city was. And I always like to share the voices of my research participants because for me, being a sociologist, it's all about the voices and the experiences. So whenever I get an opportunity, I, I just like to share those voices with an audience and kind of bring to life some of their experiences. So this is um, an excerpt from an interview I conducted um, in 2013 of a young woman. She was 20 years old. She's a college graduate, and we were talking about <coughs> the evacuation, the recovery, and the return to New Orleans. And her, her interview, her words were so powerful at the time, I actually used them in a, an article that I submitted. So I will just share those with you today before I conclude. She told me, I just wanted to go home. I did not care if there was mold. I did not care if it was ruined. I just wanted to be really close to my environment. It was not until I got to Georgia when I started to see how much the city was a part of me. Stuff that I did, other people did not. I was Catholic. People in Georgia would ask me things like, why do you talk like that? It would really frustrate me. I just felt so alienated. My grandmother was not in Georgia with us, and my Aunt Nikki was gone. I think what I missed the most was the culture. It was the little things. They did not have crawfish, no snowballs, fresh bread, <coughs> seasoning, and red beans. <coughs> but the little things do add up. And when they are taken from you, and it's like every which way you look, everything is different, eventually you are like, what do I have left? So those were the words from one of my research participants. And I think it really speaks to the experiences of a lot of those who evacuated New Orleans and left New Orleans and longed to come home. So again, thank you for having me today, and I really hope that we can add to this discussion by talking about race, class, and social vulnerability. Good morning, everyone. Is it still morning? Yeah. <laughs> My name is Antonika Morris. I'm the executive director of Housing NOLA and the president and chair of the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance. I, too, want to thank you all for convening this event and inviting me to speak here. I'm going to talk to you guys about Housing NOLA so you understand uh, what it is, what it does, and how it works. So first, we have to talk about the vision of something like Housing NOLA. We mention how, often mention how audacious and bold it is, because it is those things. And it is because we are centered around a notion that this community can provide the housing necessary for each and every one of its citizens to allow them to thrive. That is audacious, that is bold, it seems common sense, but it is not, because we look at the numbers as you heard from the earlier presentations, it is not how we function in this city, it's not how we function in this state, it's not how we function in this country, and it's certainly not how we function on this planet. Uh, this, we want to accomplish this by uh, having convened a 10-year public-private partnership, bringing community to the forefront, educating and, and making sure that they are empowering themselves, uh, and, making this, and helping their decision makers understand what they want, they need, and they themselves understanding what is possible to solve this affordability crisis. We also want to make sure everybody understands what we mean by saying affordable housing. We don't simply mean subsidized housing. We mean living in housing that you can afford. And that is something that everyone needs. 
when we get too caught up, and we, I'm just also gonna be blunt with you guys, part of the reason we got here is that we've allowed the term affordable housing to be misrepresented. It, it is code to most people for subsidized housing, which is code to for Section 8 or public housing, which means for black people. And that, we, and that's we all, well, we also can talk about this from a racial equity lens, because no matter how progressive you think you are, uh, this is the last benchmark of true progressivism. We don't, progressives don't talk about housing. Um, some of the most uh, troubling conversations I've had with white progressives have been around housing where they dismiss Section 8, where they dismiss poor black people who need housing assistance and not realizing that they are being bigots. So, uh, <laughs> so when we started Housing NOLA, this was in 2014, and it was uh, almost 10 years after Katrina's floodwaters had damaged the city, and we saw rental income at 37,000 in the city of New Orleans. It's important to call out these numbers in this way. We talk, we're talking about New Orleans' number. When you calculate the area median income, they actually use the eight metropolitan par the eight, eight parishes in the metropolitan area, and the suburbs skew higher. So AMI about this time was about 62,000 for the metro area, but in New Orleans it's 37,000. Median rent was about $907, drastic increase from pre-Katrina levels, and average home value was about $192,000. So you cannot buy a home, uh, an average home in the city of New Orleans if you make the average wages. So there's a huge mismatch in 2014. The initial partners, as I mentioned, is the public-private partnerships of the Greater New Orleans Housing Alliance, which started in 2007 as a coalition to help the hundreds of uh, thousands of folks who wanted to come and help and invest in New Orleans, and also the dozens of new CDCs that popped up that kind of didn't know anything about housing, so, you know, best of intentions, making sure that uh, they could understand how to navigate the world and the, the, the environment, and also uh, talking about genuine advocacy, uh, making some of these rule changes uh, make more sense. The Foundation for Louisiana, a local um, philanthropic uh, justice organization, and the city of New Orleans. Um, there were previous plans, there were previous attempts to address this issue. You've got, um, for the good and the bad, the Bring Back New Orleans con commissions, the UNOP plan, the city of New Orleans <laughs> launched new strategies, um, comprehensive master plan ordinance, a 10 year plan to end homelessness. The state also got in on the act. So, anybody who's here post Katrina man remembers the battle of the plans. One of the problems with these various plans, besides the fact that they all existed all, um, at the same time and there was no attempt to kind of loop them together, is uh, there's not a single accountability feature in any of them. And there was also, they, and a lot of them make big nods about community engagement, but there's also not a, uh, again, how, what does community engagement look like? So we spent a lot of time discussing that, and so we have a, an executive committee that is comprised of folks of the public-private partnership, and a leadership board that is an advi a large advisory committee that is engaged, and a community engagement strategy that just didn't talk about it. We center our work around, we start with community and we end with community. They have the first and the last word on what we're working on. And, and we use data. So part of the community engagement process meant people needed to understand what we were talking about. Um, I actually heard some facts today that are actually wrong. Um, and they are part of the conventional wisdom, they are part of the story of Katrina, and it is what decision makers who have no interest in real equity zero in on. If you don't have your facts together, if you don't have your facts right, and again, as academics, you guys might think that that's unfair, but as a black woman who's walked this earth only as a black woman, I know I have to come correct and I have to know what I'm talking about if I intend to have an impact. And if we want community to make decisions, they have to come at that. So we have to, when we talk about racial equity, we have to talk about racial reality. We cannot simply send community off to, to chum and think that if they just are passionate enough and they're excited enough, people will listen to them. That is not how the world works. So we wanted to make sure that community understood what this environment was. And also, we also had to deal with the biases associated in this. At this time, I was a developer. 
and working with community. Um, I consider myself still a community um, person rooted with community. This is my community. Uh, and some of the most frustrating conversations I would have would be community members of all races and creeds, um, the excoriating poor black people. Um, once we had, we had a, a community leader who was a woman of color say that the Treme neighborhood had enough poor black people and they didn't need any more. And also in the same Treme community, a white citizen saying, why do the residents of public housing have the right to stay in my community? And saying this out loud, uh, and so um, at that point I didn't really enjoy working with community. But this had to be an equitable process. And how do you get that same reaction from two people of color? And how do you, how do you say to a, a black woman, you can't say that. Sis, you, you can't say that. How do, how do you do that? And of, of course that means you have to do it with respect, you have to do it with love, and we also have to talk about the facts and how that attitude leads to a devaluing of your property because you, I, I, tell, I tell folks all the time, white people cannot tell the difference between different kinds of black people, right? They can't pick out the good black ones from the bad black ones. So we need to stop talking about like, us like good and bad and hoping that they can figure out the difference because they can't. Um, we need, that's been proven time and time and time again. They, they, y'all can't. So what does that mean? We need to talk about the facts. We need to talk about the data. So making sure community understood what had happened, why this was happening, and that affordable housing were not, was not a dirty word. You want affordable housing. You actually need affordable housing in order to thrive. Uh, this frustrated a lot of people, particularly folks who had signed up for our policy working group because they just wanted to fix the problem and we told them, no, you have to wait because community has to be able to participate in this process. So you have to wait and you have to take your cues from them. And then we also added a third level of community engagement. We have volunteer review team members who review all of our documents and are the last word. When everybody does all the work and all the information is done and as we set the agenda, they come in and give the thumbs up or thumbs down to what goes into the plan and when it is applied and when it is um, actually executed. So we also came up with some real goals about what this plan needed to do. That we were talking about preserving home ownership, I mean, I'm sorry, preserving housing, um, and preventing future displacement, fair housing, sustainable design, and accessibility. I'm gonna go quickly, because we just talked about community engagement. We wanted to talk about why this was necessary. I wanna make sure y'all see this. So pre-Katrina, rents, 45% uh, of the rental market rented between $300 and $499. Post-storm, those homes and apartments were replaced by units starting at $750 going up to $1,500. And wages didn't change. Pre-Katrina, 60% of the homes that people owned were valued at $100,000 or less. Post-Katrina, those have been replaced buy homes starting at $200,000 going up to the million. And I want to make sure you don't notice the quadrupling of homes between the $500,000 and million dollar marks. Um, so housing supply, we had done a lot of work rebuilding, building new. About 90,000 subsidized housing units came online and we still ended up with an affordable housing crisis. We calculated real demand and that's where we get the 33,000. So we talked about uh, the loss of units, we talk about adjustments for vacancy, and what is in the pipeline, the number is 33,600 affordable housing opportunities, and that's a very specific phrase. We are not simply talking about building or constructing 33,600 new units, although we could, right? We can totally fit that here. Um, vacant properties, uh, blighted and abandoned properties, the fact that this was a city built for 650,000 and we don't have 400,000 means we have room for all of this. But what we're also talking about is preserving the community fabric and allowing people to stay in their neighborhood. So if you are living in a neighborhood that is meeting your needs in all other ways and you just can't afford to be there, how do we create that home, make that home or apartment affordable? And so that's, that's why this is such a complex 
policy discussion. We're talking, we look at insurance. We look at property taxes. We look at utilities. Your home, there are, because of our, our utility rates here in Louisiana and in New Orleans in particular, we have a lot of people who are cost burdened because of their utilities. Their rent or mortgage is okay. Their utilities, because they're living in a bratty old house. And so how do we make that unit energy efficient? It's one of the reasons why we stood shoulder to shoulder with our friends in environmental justice and um, energy efficiency to oppose the new power plant in New Orleans East because it's only going to increase our utility costs. We could take that money and invest in energy efficiency, not solar panels or wet or some other wackadoo or the, the dismissive things that people come up with like windmills or things like that, but real energy efficiency, which means investing in the homes of the people of New Orleans. Uh, the public partners, as I said, we, we've been working with the public partners. They actually committed to, this is the state, the federal government, and the city looking at their pipeline, and they said, we can kick in 7,700, we rounded that down to 7,500 units on, on this 33,000. So those would mostly be focused on the most vulnerable, right? And we break down the 33,000 by income band and tenure type and bedroom size. So we know what people need at every level. Um, and so that, but that still leaves us with a huge amount of units that we need. And one of the things that's very interesting is that there's a huge demand, of course, for the low income traditional concept of people making less than 30% AMI. So that's minimum wage workers here in New Orleans. But there's also a strong demand for people who don't qualify for any assistance. Again, that middle class that needs help. And we have to acknowledge that because that's how we're pitted against each other in an equity, in, in, in this, in this <laughs> racial equity strife, right? The middle class is told it's the poor people who are keeping you away from this. And that if you only, if you push them off the government teeth, you can get what you need. They're dragging you down. When we're all actually not getting what we need. So we also included, like I mentioned, an accountability feature. So we do an annual report card. Um, so we've done one every year. It, it's been very interesting and enlightening because folks uh, realize that we're not going away. <laughs> and so as we move through this, um, we see now the current state of housing because those report cards have seen a decline because we are lacking the political will necessary to implement this plan correctly. We've got, so the current state of housing is still, incomes are still very much where they are, rents are going up, average home sales are going up, so what do we do about this, right? We've got a plan that we know from the, the data, from the policies, it will actually work if we implement it. So we've got a number of external challenges at the federal level, or the federal foolishness, like I like to call it. Local, Louisiana is incredibly hostile to New Orleans, um, in a number of ways. And here in New Orleans, we have our, our weapons of mass distraction that we deploy on a routine basis to, dis to, to, to move us off this. Um, and so we started thinking about this differently from a political power perspective, right? How do we get this? So we conducted a poll where this was determined affordable housing was the second biggest issue to likely voters. That blew everybody's minds. We saw overwhelming support for the policies that we were struggling to implement. And so we launched Put Housing First, which is a campaign uh, to make sure that there's accountability, not simply in this plan, but also with our elected officials. Um, so this year, our priorities are adapt and implement our smart housing mix. And there's a handout about what it is. That's our version of mandatory inclusion in Arizona, which I'm very pleased to say got a cast yesterday by our city council. So we're doing OK. Thank you. Um, the public partners, on the other hand, need quite a talking to. They have massively failed at bring, delivering those 7,500 units. Last year, we actually lost. The report was negative 126 of, uh, subsidized affordable units. So we've got to get them to get their act together, as well as securing more funding for this. And so again, coming back to what we do, this roadmap that Fallon mentioned, and how we intend to um, commit to our vision of making sure that New Orleans can provide high quality, safe, and accessible housing to all of its citizens. Thank you.
So hello, uh, I am Saire Dinsi Flores and I am an associate professor at, uh, in sociology and Latin and Caribbean studies at uh, Rutgers University. I am uh, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here and happy to be part of this panel and this conversation. As a respondent, I was tasked with bringing in a comparative case study into the questions of who, when, how, and why people move. Uh, and uh, I am looking forward to a conversation and seeing where the convergences are. Um, I am showing this uh, pic, which is shows Puerto Rico, uh, the island that's lit up there in the Caribbean basin, comparatively to the other um, islands and countries uh, of the Caribbean. Um, and I show it because this is pre-Hurricane Maria, which hit on September 20th, 2017. Uh, for the Caribbean, not just in Puerto Rico, uh, to great devastation. And when that happens, Puerto Rico goes dark, um, and it becomes the unshining star of the Caribbean. And so today I want to offer a, a reflection on the idea of development as related to resiliency. Uh, so I'm moving geographically here. Um, and in particular, uh, 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 resiliency through housing uh, by looking at Puerto Rico. So typically development is thought of as going from you know a temporary shelter to a permanent um, uh, shelter and uh, resiliency accordingly is also seen as being as becoming more stable, static, durable, uh, staying put, not retreating, right? Um, and so uh, I want to rethink this directionality, where this idea of development comes from. And I'm thinking here development, not only urban development, but also international sort of um, types of development. <coughs> um, because part of what development also does is create massive inequality. And so I'm, I'm going to move and, uh, rather quickly through uh, measures of inequality, but in Puerto Rico, from the time that development really began to take a hold, which is in the middle of the 20th century, in the 1950s, you see this spike with rising inequality. So, or, or the, the appearance that inequality is then coming down because of certain dynamics of migration and movement, and then increase. But I want to think about what if um, instead of thinking of development as static, we might think of uh, movement and migration as a way of life. And this image uh, comes from uh, a paper by um, architects and engineers, uh, Samson et al. And the title of the paper is Resilience in Pre-Columbian Caribbean House Building, a Dialogue Between Archaeology and Humanitarian Shelter. And what they see here is that pre-Columbian shelters actually had, were resilient to hurricanes. And so they show us architecturally uh, why um, the design was resilient, but one of the elements of resilience was about movement. The fact that these shelters were rather easy to take down and put back up was part of what made them resilient. What if we thought about the Caribbean as a, always a site of movement and migration? And in sort of yesterday, I was uh, I enjoyed the panel uh, yesterday where um, uh, also Aurora Morales Levy speaks of what if we reimagined, right? Um, and what if we thought of movement rather than static, stat static and being stable as the path forward? And you know, I'm thinking of the Caribbean. The Caribbean from 40, you know, 1492, from that very, you know, that, that that watershed moment, is a place of constant movement. I think of myself um, as a descendant of African um, uh, uh, people that were captured and 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 
and brought and put to work as slaves, put up uh, as slaves, uh, and also as a person who, whose family each generation has been jumping islands, right? Um, including myself, migrating from Puerto Rico to uh, the US, but every generation has been living in the Caribbean in a different island. So that this is true of Caribbean way of life, and the authors uh, speak of this architecture as a Caribbean mode of architecture. So what if we think of the many reasons why Puerto Ricans have left their homes in the 20th century, and the responses, the housing that has been created to shelter those moves or to address those moves. So I'm thinking here about the 1950s external migrations uh, as a result of the industrial, industrialization programs, both for the island, but also uh, uh, sending Puerto Ricans off to the metropole, to New York and the Midwest, to uh, become the laborers of the factories um, in the US. I'm also thinking of rural to urban migration as a result of that industrialization that uh, sort of to inflect modernity and um, uh, provide economic opportunities that shifted the focus of the economy from the sugar uh, uh, plantation economy to uh, industrial uh, uh, urbanity. And then also the creation as a result of informal housing through squatter uh, settlements that then there was a demand for formal housing and the creation of uh, uh, single family developments on the one end for upwardly mobile, mobile people, but then on the other hand public housing uh, for, uh, for uh, who were considered to be uh, low income um, uh, communities. And then uh, the, the impact of insecurity and lack of safety or um, unsafety as a result of not only violence but also climate disaster later in the 20th century. So I want to put this, um, this is just, I was just in Puerto Rico and this is a picture from last week. But this is um, the uh, sugar mill in Ponce, in the southern town of Ponce, and it showcases, it's obviously abandoned, right? And it showcases the consequences, right, of massive um, economic uh, infusion, right, in the form of plantation in a colonial type of situation, which I think is important to retain as we think of development, right, as the Let's, let's make it all beautiful and static and stable, but that it comes with the sort of legacies and, and um, dynamics of co colony and empire that results in ruins at the end. So what are the ruins? Some of these migrations, right, that result in ruins, the move from the US to uh, to New York, uh, more prominently places like the South Bronx, where you have the, the <laughs> I know um, Mocho will be talking about the South Bronx later, but uh, to the false promises, right, of what that migration prom what that mi migration would result in, to the let's get rid of the slums, what were considered slums and squatter settlements, um, El Fanguito there on the top left, to the speak and stand public housing, Puerto Rico became the second largest public housing system in the, in the federal US system. Um, that would be a long story, but just take that away. And then the, uh, and then the residential development tracks in Puerto Rico becoming a laboratory for a lot of this suburban type of single family development that defined uh, how we would ascend, how Puerto Rico would ascend from these inadequate housing there on the left to formal single family ownership housing. So the move is always, has always been part of the policy with some designated housing configurations of what, of how to house that movement within a political economic system, right, that define what were not only the ways in which people should be moving, but also the places where they should 
end up in. Uh, and then insecurity and crime, and I've written you know, uh, about this, results in a new type of design, which is gated communities, where we have an island that is mostly fenced off residentially. To the insecurity of the hurricane, um, where, uh, where development culminates, right, in investments that make the island more vulnerable. So going from shining star to unshining star is literally a, a reflection of the creation of an in, in, inadequate uh, power grid that at, at some point, right, it was considered to be the best in the Caribbean, the best model uh, for the Caribbean. So, um, so some of the responses uh, from that development, now uh, as a result of Hurricane Maria, what people have seen is an opportunity to redefine, right? To reimagine. Uh, so, and a lot of these responses have come in the form of self-sufficient sort of efforts by individuals to address the vulnerabilities that had been created that people were largely unaware of during the 20th century. And so here, housing is seen as one of the keys to Puerto Rico's recovery. And what now has come into view is all of the um, inadequacies of that development that just two years ago seemed to be well, more than that, given a, a fiscal crisis, but that seemed to be fantastic for the island, a model, right? Puerto Ricans would say, yeah, we have power, and look at places like Dominican Republic next door, like, you know, they go dark, and, right? Like, it was the Chinese stuff, right? It stopped being so, so now the cracks have shown, and uh, what we started to see is things like there is a lot of informal housing in the island, uh, that hasn't been given proper, um, uh, uh, regulated properly, um, and many abandoned spaces. And funds then are being sought to see how to address this. So we see some markers of this for the Public Housing Authority who has been in um, crisis for a long time. We see now, uh, now investments into mostly cosmetic renovations, but also things like the creation of um, what was unheard of before in Puerto Rico of mixed income communities, a la Hope Six style mixed income communities, not with the eradication of public housing because of the, we were talking yesterday, because of the mass amount, uh, the, the large population that lives in public housing, but the sort of attempts at uh, <coughs> defining how Puerto Ricans move when in fact they have uh, lived in rather segregated ways prior to uh, the hurricane. Uh, and whether this is possible, it's still to be seen. Uh, this is some of the, you know, a modern city, a modern life in, a, in an old city is sort of the, the what is being purported as a new idea, but really is an old idea that to mix reviews has been happening in, in, in the U.S. Other things that have happened is that things like this were an abandoned uh, school in a uh, central town of Lares. Became, uh, became housing for some families. Some families decided to make that their housing. So thinking about these abandoned, uh, quote unquote, um, abandoned structures of development, right, themselves of the educational system that the US uh, it, it has funded and in some, in many ways, um, defined, uh, they become uh, other type for other uses. We see other self-sufficient efforts like uh, using shipping containers uh, uh, as resilient housing hurricane structures. And these two architects, 
a Maria Gabriela Velasco and Carla Gautier, very enthusiastically talk about their shipping containers and how they uh, are more affordable for uh, Puerto Ricans with very low median income, yearly median incomes. In the island, the catch is that they are building it for whoever can pay, you know, without financing. And then there are efforts like this, which is, uh, this is Cerro Cabrera in, um, in Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. And this is actually an effort by, there are three neighborhoods th that look like this, where an artist went to a community and said, I wanna, you know, paint your houses. And, uh, and there was some resistance from the community and eventually they agreed. And now the consensus is that, uh, that it, it, it has been a positive thing for the community. Uh, of course, if you look from down there, it looks pretty and what a great project. And if you start going up those stairs on the left, you start seeing the cracks of the project. First, you go up the stairs and there's nobody anywhere. Um, so most of these houses that are there are abandoned. They, there's nobody living there. Uh, and, and then you get up and you see the houses that blew away with the hurricane and the people that never returned. And some, a few that stay, that, uh, that are still in support of the project, but you see that actually behind the colorful facade, there, is, there are the blue tarps, right? Um, of of uh, the informal housing that is there. So, uh, so what we see here is that, in fact, these communities have been left to uh, rot, quite literally. And the people that uh, had, way, had moved out way before the hurricane. And so the solutions of stability and revival and uh, sort of replicate this idea that these communities are here, when in fact uh, they have been in motion and movement. And so part of sort of my, my proposition here is to not only define risk by the hurricane, and not only, but by the, also by the configuration of the political economic system, the racial capitalism, the colonialism that predates uh, the hurricane, but and that continues. And also to kind of um, talk a little bit about the, the challenges or the risk of leaving policy out of the discussion. Because in this self-sufficient reimagination, we sort of devise that people can go around and, and make, their, make way right, for themselves but it also takes away the responsibility from policy. So how do we think about um, uh, undoing right, a lot of what the uh, efforts, the policy of quote unquote master planning, which I hate the master, plan, master part of that um, description, but, uh, but how do we return to a Caribbean mode of policy? How do we return to a way of interfacing with these communities in ways that acknowledges that we have been moving, right? In quite literally, moving as a result of the very throat of uh, the political economic system that we've um, been a part of. I love a quote by Stuart Hall, and he says, um, you know, you can't go back through the eye of the needle uh, in Caribbean history. We cannot unstitch it from its colonial um, situate, its colonial um, realities. Uh, and and so his proposition here is how do we enact a new modernity, right? Not the old modernity where we're gonna build the U.S. in the Caribbean. We're gonna build the public housing for in Puerto Rico or the Caribbean that replicates 
the, the best practices of the, of the empire, but how do we rethink this idea of movement? And so in bringing in this um, pre-Columbian structures, how might we reimagine precisely what that looks like, right? Where we're not necessarily moving into, into fixed city and stability, but into a more, um, uh, in, into understanding movement as part of uh, what uh, needs to happen. So thank you. Thank you all for some very thought-provoking presentations. I'm sure we're all going to need all the lunch to really mull through. Um, but perhaps we can at least jumpstart some of those conversations that will take place over a meal. Um, and I, I'm going to open it up to the audience in a minute, but I do want to first um, provide the panelists with an opportunity to engage with each other's work. and. Um, <coughs> And in particular, I think one of the things that's so heart-wrenching about all the work that you all are doing and all the other panelists and many people in this room is that it is, you know, there's a term of engagement as, a, and it's, it's such a, um, it's such a, it's a word that doesn't really capture what people are actually doing because engagement is as if you can retreat back into some space in which you're no longer engaged. And, um, and, and I do, um, you know, that being the, the kind of headline of this, of this symposium, um, want to ask you all about this hypothetical. All of your work grapples with a <coughs> institution or a community, um, an alliance of individuals, a movement, that is really the linchpin to there being some cultural competency, ecological um, competency, and, and empathy embedded in, the, in housing policy, in disaster policy, um, and land policy, development policy, so forth. And so what happens when housing NOLA steps back <coughs> Who and what are being um, put in prepared to play the same role, even if these organizations don't set that, as chart, as um, the organizations on the ground in Puerto Rico? Like, what is the infrastructure for uh, for the movement? And um, and so I'll leave that there. <laughs> I'll start. <laughs> yes, since I was the first one to take the mat. My, so part of our strategy, and Fallon knows this, uh, is that we are, I am trying to work myself out of a job. Uh, it is one of the things that is frustrating about nonprofits. Um, I started my career actually as a bureaucrat working at the housing authority, uh, then became a developer, and now I'm an advocate. So I come to this from a slightly different lens, and while there are uh, organizations that do incredibly good work that I don't think should go away, I don't think mine is one of them, uh, <laughs> I think we should evolve. I think it, doing this right means that there is a new system in place that is uh, built with understanding and acknowledging the disparities, the racial inequities, and that community is front and center inside of that. So that's why we start and stop with community, the review team members that we work with, we actually compensate them because they are, have to be a part of this. any, when, when, I, when we get data analysis, when we get policy analysis, these are things that nonprofits and government entities pay for. So why aren't we compensating our community members to make sure that they understand that their their input is not simply, uh, you know, it's not a check the box, it's not perfunctory, it is actually valued, and, and that's a that's a concept people grapple with, 
uh, because you hear people say all the time, particularly the wider progressives, so in short, well, they shouldn't be paid to care about their community, right? Um, as if we're here for free. And that's the first time I had that conversation with someone, they, you know, I said, well, you're being paid to care about the community. You're not here for free. I'm not here for free. So why shouldn't they, and again, that's an acknowledgement that they have lives. And the, I mean, again, it's, it's about how you think about this equitably, right? That on top of everything that we ask, the folks who make this city what it is, the musicians, uh, the maids, the healthcare workers, everything that is necessary for what do you think about New Orleans the, and the people who are responsible for that. I think Farrah talked about it beautifully, the folks who desperately wanted to come back to the city because they're the reason it's back on its feet. Even though they have not gotten a fair shake, it is for them, it is because of them. So all of those people, they're doing everything they gotta do and then we gotta say you also need to come to a meeting and be your best self for nothing. Okay, and that doesn't work. So we can keep pretending that it works. Um, and so we say no, we have to do more than simply empower. We have to educate, make sure that there's space, they empower themselves. And then again, that's so why we move into, we move very quickly into this political movement concept because this, we need a new system. And once we have a new system, systems are really good at protecting themselves, right? But we've got to break down the one that we have and rebuild another one. <laughs> uh, I, I know the, uh, the person that introduced this whole event said things could get contentious at times, and that's a healthy thing, so let me throw a little contentiousness into this whole discussion. Um, for Andrea Neek, I'm pronouncing your name. No. I, I put that. Well, Sharon Jasper, your former panel board member, told me that was the correct pronunciation. Miss Morris, I, I would argue that the problem is the public-private partnership. That is that has gotten us to the crisis situation that we are in now. That public-private partnership is central to the whole fire capitalist model of. They're increasing their their uh, the uh, rent intensification agenda. I mean, if we look at the St. Thomas tragedy, right? That's where my research was, and I, I, mean, I thought your research was excellent. I hope you'll share your PowerPoint, much more impressive than mine. But uh, St. Thomas was 1,510 public housing units, right? There were problems there. People had real solutions, right? They recognized the problem. But going into the public-private partnership, right, with the big developers, uh, with, with community, community activists, and with the city in Hano, what did it end up? What, what was the product of that? That was a huge disaster. Most people were displaced. We don't even, no one was really followed. How many people died being displaced? People talked about the attachment to place. Uh, Farrah did a great job of that. That kills people, right? And that furthered the huge uh, gentrification of the surrounding area, right? And these philanthropists, which are part of the public private partnership, right? They put people on the payroll because they're going to follow what is acceptable to their funders. They're not idiots, right? So yeah, we need people in a movement to be, they need a salary, but if they're being on the payroll of these philanthropic organizations, which are key partners in this whole public-private partnership, it's not going to end with a, with a, a, a happy ending for working class people. So I'll end it here because I don't like going to presentations where the audience, when I'm part of the audience and I don't get a chance to talk and ask questions, but I would say the starting point for making any advance is ending, breaking the public-private, shattering the public-private partnership that has gotten us into this crisis. Well, okay. uh, I, I think I, I, I think I'll, uh, I'd rather hear. Okay. I don't. Yeah, I, well, I, that's what I would say. Well, well okay. I, can, I, I don't have much to add besides what I said towards the end of my presentation about um, the the trappings of uh, 
of thinking that you can just um, flow money into communities and that that will resolve the issues because that is also a measure, a way to reproduce inequality. I think that we have to hold um, government and policy accountable as well. Questions? All right. Yes, go ahead. We'll start there and then go to the back and then come back. Thank you. If you give me a minute or two. Uh, being a pre-Katrina New Orleanian who earned his MA and PhD from New Orleans in political science, who went on to become a Katrina survivor, a holdout who refused to evacuate, who was part of the first movement to try to help define what post-Katrina New Orleans would be about, and had faced a lot of repression, uh, then on to becoming a member of the Right of Return movement with an emphasis on public housing. I've been active before the storm on that, but that was kind of our focus. On to being somebody who to this day is involved in many social justice struggles, but with many emphasis, a great deal of emphasis on um, housing, affordable housing, kind of a... I have every feeling you can imagine when it comes to trying to talk about these issues. You know what the world I have seen? I was in academia, okay? Then I checked out, okay? I'm a tarot card reader on Bourbon Street. Okay, that's what I was on, um, oh, I was a tarot card reader on Jackson Square when Katrina hit. And so the world I have seen is a world that can be seen partially through your eyes, and partially through the eyes of a Katrina survivor and a working class person just struggling to get by. Okay? And that I just wanted to get across just to get off my chest. Okay? Now I'm a socialist and I have been forever. I moved here in 83. And uh, so I see the world through that perspective. Okay? And I remember walking the streets of New Orleans when there was practically no one here in the areas that weren't flooded and thinking, what's next? And this is from the eyes of the survivor. I was busy hustling, trying to survive for myself and my partner, but I was also thinking, what's next? And then, um, I may have heard of Amy Goodman. She happened to be in town and ran into me to the one bar that was open in the quarter. And uh, she asked me to give her a tour to the places we could go to. And one of the first places I emphasized that we should go to is the Iberville Housing Development. So I was a member of C3 Hands Off Iberville. Because I knew in my gut feeling they were going to go after public housing. And sure enough, they did. Iberville was the last one they shut down because basically with our limited army, which was a mixture of residents and uh, community supporters, that was stopped. And that was because the Bush administration refused to let Ray May and bully them into knocking that project down. Though they were happy to knock down all the other projects. So, my starting point for having fair housing in New Orleans, how can you have a fair housing regime in this city if you don't have public housing? Do you know that the state law prohibits rent control? in Louisiana, and because it prohibits rent control, the only form of really effective rent control that's been demonstrated in this city's history is public housing, low-income public housing. And I can remember the time walking through the French Quarter right after Governor Blanco, Republican Nazi, lifted the order to uh, prohibit evictions. You talk about evictions? I walked through just block after block after block of people's possessions being dumped out on the sidewalk. And these weren't the possessions of people whose houses had been flooded, which they would have been thrown out anyways. These were possessions that had survived Katrina. And because the people couldn't get back, they just dumped their possessions, all their worldly possessions in a time of incredible need on 
the floor, on, on the sidewalk, and I walk by and think, what a, what a fucking, I'm already traumatized, but what a horror. So as far as the evacuation plan, I think that's one thing that needs to be put into it. No evictions. And not just for a month, but for months, maybe a year. No evictions. Okay, because I saw what that did to so many of the people who were fortunate enough to live in a place that survived Katrina, but then, because of politics, they got their possessions thrown out on the street while they were still just trying to recover from the flooding. I do want to thank okay. you. Okay, all right, okay. Well, but I have, I have a couple of questions, and I'll answer them. I just want to make sure that other people can I understand. Hear. I understand. I understand. I'm the hog in the mic. Okay? It's just I don't get any opportunities because I do not work with a nonprofit. I'm not with an academic institution. And I don't get many opportunities to speak. I understand, I speak to city council basically, but I understand this. Okay, I have several questions. All right. First of all, with regards to poor homeowners, okay, so something I'm working with with other members. Uh, has like Housing NOLA thought about suing the city of New Orleans for utilizing civicsource.com to con conduct auctions of people who are behind on their property taxes? Because the Louisiana Constitution prohibits that. And there was, in uh, 2014, there was a vote to legalize it, and the voters rejected it. That's one question. And then there's the question of public housing. All right, we had 14,000 public housing units when I moved here in 83. We've got 2,000. Obviously, given the conditions in Louisiana, central to rebuilding affordable housing is re replenishing our public housing stock. Is there anything attempted, being attempted there by any people on the panel other than, you know, I go to meetings and there are little victories. Those are the main things I'm stating right here. Thank you. And um, I think we can add in another couple of questions. And while I'm doing that, I just want to say I do think that, you know, one of the things that we didn't get a, a chance to really, eviction is a huge topic, right, which is an old conference. There are a couple actual exhibitions going on in the city uh, around that topic. And I don't want to dismiss that as a vital part of this conversation. And there is a really blurry line between <coughs> eviction and evacuation. Um, when, you know, not being able to come back is not always a financial matter, but sometimes a legal matter, and that the place that you once called home is, protect, is by law no longer your home, um, even though you may see it that way. So I do thank you for raising that point. Sir in the back. Well, first off, I'd like to thank the entire panel for their presentation. Uh, now, the past didn't work. You know, uh, as most of my background is in retail management, I'm a non-traditional student at UNLV. We have to agree that the past didn't work, but how do we go to the future? Now, the respondent showed us one option, but to create that sense of urgency, we need to go to, I believe, we need to go to that fire industry or capitalist system and to show them the options. Yes, we have the respondents options, but New Orleans is a tourist town. Do we go either that way, or do we go the way of Venice and how they don't have a, a service industry in Venice, and it's just a tourist trap? Do we go that way, or do we go, what way can we influence? Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's look at what will be best for New Orleans. Thank you. We'll take one more question so that then you have enough questions for the panel to answer. Okay, so I would like to thank everybody on the panel. Um, all of your presentations were really good. Um, I have a few questions. So my first question was for Ms. Morris. Ms. Morris, you said something about uh, real energy efficiency in homes. And I wanted to know when you said, uh, you know, not all that wacky stuff, like, and you were very specific about what it was that you meant. I wanted to ask you if you could say more about it, especially because our next panel is about greenwashing. And uh, I know that people in the city had issues with solar panels and things like that. So I, I was asking you to speak more on it. And then also uh, for the respondent, 
I, um, I found your pre-Columbian structures to be very interesting. Um, I'm also thinking back to the last panel on Ms. Verdon's uh, presentation where you showed the house with the palmetto um, rooftop. And so I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, as this gentleman said, the past didn't work, but it seems like um, we're looking back toward past structures and previous structures that did work, um, that did seem to have more, I don't want to say resiliency, but the ability to be able to take on um, water, hurricanes, and be more into motion and movement that we're more accustomed to. So I wanted to know if you could just speak a little bit more on that as well. Thank you. So to recap, we've got civic source, energy efficiency. Uh, <laughs> sorry, just to recap the questions. Topic-wise, civic source, energy efficiency, and we have um, architectural, resilient to architecture, and the broader subject of replenishing public housing. Replenishing public housing. <clears throat> and the question about yes, how. and the how, what role the fire industries play in any one of those different matters, because Civic Source is a private company. Yes. So I want to be clear when I was saying quote unquote wacky, I was not trying to dismiss energy efficient or green infrastructure. I'm trying to make sure that folks understand how it can be dismissed, right? How, oh people, we can't do solar panels, we can't do windmills. And the green infrastructure and the energy efficiency uh, industry does not do themselves any favors in how they uh, combat this. It is, I think, emblematic of that two coast thinking, right? You get the East Coast and the West Coast and they're just thinking, oh, y'all are dumb in the South and y'all don't know what y'all are talking about. And I know that because I work with a number of energy efficiency partners at a national level. And they are not, they're missing the opportunity here. When we talk about the Green New Deal, Louisiana, Interestingly enough, in New Orleans is at the crossroads and at, there's a lot of investment that's coming because of the coastal plans, because of our watershed planning, that we can implement a lot of these strategies if we center equity, if we talk about racial equity and we come up with these plans, instead of doing green investment that enriches white owners, right, making their property more valuable for the sake of that, and then there's an indirect um, there's an indirect benefit to the renter, their light bill might be a little bit lower, right? We need to be talking about how do we keep black land ownership, how do we keep black homeowners who are struggling to pay their utility bills, who are also struggling to pay their property taxes. So Housing NOLA isn't considering suing. Mike, one of the things that we're what we are working on is how do we freeze property taxes for low income homeowners so they can stay in their homes and then also adding energy efficiency to that, making those investments, because code enforcement and historic district landmark commissions, those are kind of predatory elements that also put you in the crosshairs of a civic source. So we're looking at uh, how do we maintain and increase black home ownership, black land ownership, because one of the original sins around housing, and this goes way back before, uh, before Clinton and Bush, uh, Reagan's a big highlight in this, but this goes back to the GI Bill and the sins that led to redlining. We like to think of this as uh, simply something that bigots did and banks did, but this is something that our government also did, right? By affording uh, only whites the opportunity to take advantage of wealth, the wealth building opportunity that is home ownership in this country. And now what we have coming full circle is, well, you know, Home ownership isn't working for black and brown communities, so they don't need it, right? Even though the land, the ownership of land, and the lack, the, the the fact that black and brown communities have not been able to access this as a generational wealth building opportunity is the reason for the racial wealth divide, right? And when we talk about not solving that from that perspective, when we don't talk about that, we miss the boat. And I must, I feel the overwhelming need to address two comments or. To, to, make, to, to deal with the elephant in the room. Jay, you and I have known each other for 15 years. Uh, you've never bothered to learn my name. Mike, you and I have known each other as well. And the fact that you all feel the need to disconnect from this work is the, one of the biggest problems when we talk about the racial issues. That as white men who don't live in public housing, you can step away from this issue, dismiss me as a black woman, and then, then tell me that you got 
is from another black woman. That that's how you know, that you heard how to pronounce my name, even though I was introduced twice. I introduced myself. And it seems like a small and petty thing, but I want you guys to understand this, and that's why I felt the need to point it out. The ignoring me, ignoring my work, pretending like it doesn't exist, is emblematic of this problem. If we're talking about power, black people have to have power and agency over themselves. That is what we are talking about. White people have too much power over determining my fate and the fate of black and brown people in this country. And that has to stop. And that has to stop by you listening to black and brown people, especially when they have the temerity to disagree with you. Especially then. You sound exactly like John Luther, who is the executive vice president of the Home Builders Association, who stood up yesterday and said that he has not been granted a seat at the table because he's in opposition to our smart housing mix. He has not been invited to speak at the table. Well, I was pointing at him. Well, he's not in that either. I know who he is. He, he said, Jay just talked about this, and, and Mike, you talked about it too. You talked about the fact that you don't work with us. You're still here. We're still here. You don't bother to work with me. You've never attempted to connect with me. You've never done anything to try to connect with us. And that's, from the so I'm a black woman born and raised in this community and so it's my job to engage with you. You tried to How? please people like us by not acknowledging our existence, by whispering, that's a big part of it, by whispering campaigns. You worked at Hanno, you know what was going on at Hanno. Yeah, I, I do know what's going on at Hanno. I actually do know what's going on. And again, well, you're a white man. What did Kelsey Nola do? What did Kelsey Nola do for the black men and women? in the projects when they were being, they voted to knock them down. Well, how's it know that didn't exist then? But we want to talk about yeah, well, what I did. Yeah, yeah what, what did our leaders, what leaders, you mean the black leaders of this community? Well, the people who know who are leaders of housing know what now. I'd like to know. That's me. Okay, good. That's me. Okay, what did good. I do? What did I do? I encourage the redevelopment of public housing. I don't, I don't shirk away from that. I don't shy away from that. Okay. And when you talk to African Americans in this city, and they talk about the fact that they wanted public housing redeveloped for our brothers and sisters, that we did not want black people to have to be confined to the conditions that was public housing before the storm, that black people do not have to live in garbage communities and garbage We're housing. Garbage community, please. Excuse me. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is obviously a conversation that extends far beyond the scopes of this panel. And that's not to dismiss this debate, because this is, this is what the debate is. This is the debate that's going on outside of these walls, in this city, in this country. And the reality is, is that there are more characters in this story than are present in this room. And if all of they were here, this, the, the whole, we wouldn't need a program. Because, I mean, and that's, I mean, but, and that's the reality, um, but I think that it needs to be acknowledged that those other voices that would be as passionate in this debate aren't present here today. And that's part of the framing of this conference, of which we are, as organizers, complicit in, but it's also uh, part of the ways in which the topics of this conversation, broadly speaking, as a symposium, are represented by all those of us who are involved in this work. How do we represent the work that we do such that those people feel invited? When they, they got the, thing, the, the notice, in, in a lot of cases, they saw the flyers, but did they feel like this was a space to come in and talk about their issues? To talk about what they, as a maybe mid-career professional, changing their plan for their future, what place they have in this is this an industry that they can come work in? Is this a field that they can become educated in? And so I do want to make sure that as we continue in the program today, that yes, there is space for these debates to go on, and even if we still have to keep rolling with the program. <laughs> so I do want to give John, Jay a, time, a chance to speak, and I know Zyra <laughs> wanted to speak earlier as well, but we're gonna break for lunch and come back at two no matter what. But just just keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, so uh, again, contentiousness, uh, I think this is good. We need more of this. 
Uh, but to respond to, to Ms. Morris, I'm not going to butcher your first name again and get attacked, but I think it's really, uh, we should not, uh, we, we, when we, we don't refer to the white community, right? It's divided by class, by political ideologies, many different ways. Likewise, with the black community. I mean, you said, who spoke for the black community post-Katrina around public housing? Was there one voice? No, there were different voices. There was the black political class who were uniformly down for smashing public housing as part of a renaissance of the city. And there were many people in the nonprofit complex that were all for that. People like Barbara Major, who was for down with involved in the St. Thomas, <coughs> said we got to give this stuff up. You, as part of Providence Community Housing, you were on the front. And I don't ever remember dealing with you one on one. I read about you in the paper. I knew who you were, but I never had any interactions with you. But I knew the work that you were involved in. You were on the other side of the barricades. There were other black people. Right? Like the gentleman who had that apartment who was trying to reoccupy that were opposed to your agenda, to those white and black on the other side of the barricade. So I don't think this gets anywhere of talking about the black community. There were different tendencies. Um, so we got to break that up. I think that's important. And, and getting back to the, to the other question of where we go, I think in the back, and I want to give Zaire a chance to also respond because there was a question directed to her. But what I liked about this conference is that it put the big issues on the agenda, right? Democracy in retreat, right? We've got these right-wing fascists, proto-fascists around the world arising in the context of this capitalist crisis. We've got the, the climate crisis. It's, it's, it's real, right? And so we've got to be bold on how we respond. And what I see as exciting is the demand for a, a, a Green New Deal. Now, it's kind of an empty vessel, and the danger is, on one side, well, the Republicans are, are attacking this openly, but the, the, other, the other attack is through the, the Democratic Party, the whole uh, philo ph philanthropic capitalist sector, who are going to fill it and kill it, right, with their public-private partnership definition. But if the New Green Deal is going to be effective, it's got to be what we were arguing for, the grassroots forces, black and white, immigrant and Latino, in the post-Katrina period, who knew New Orleans was a, was a had serious problems before Katrina. Everyone knew that. Uh, but we, we rejected the disaster capitalist agenda, their, their solution that they were ramming down our throat, uh, and that was, yeah, a multiracial movement, the disaster capitalism. It was, it was black and white, Latino immigrant. Um, but we were arguing for against that agenda, and for we needed a direct government employment, democratically controlled. That's going to be, and I think that's missing from the current discussions around the, the Green New Deal. That's going to be democratically controlled. And the resources, the resources are crucial. You need that. But they have to be democratically decided. And to do that, it's not going to be win-win. It's got to be win for the working class and lose for the ruling class. We've got to take that wealth back. And that is going to be a huge, momentous struggle. And we're going to have to have ideological fight against the public-private partnership and that ideology and how we build a real working class working class movement. And I think we gotta have, you know, struggle with Jacobin where Daniel has been writing in that whole project of questioning what's gonna be the political vehicle. I don't think there's been enough serious discussion about that. Uh, and having a politics where um, the movements control our candidates that we run, that they are beholden to us. So when AOC is up there and she's done Tremendous work. She's very talented in getting the word out and combating the right wing. But she's also got to be democratically beholden to that movement because there will be powerful forces. There are powerful forces that are going to take her away. And operating with the Democratic Party, I don't think you're going to be able to. To 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 uh, the, the gravity is too strong to be pulled to the to the other side. But I'll, I'll end here and hope for more discussions and, and during lunch, and I want to give it to Zaire.
It's not a joke. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, I, I, it's hard to jump in here in this conversation, uh, but uh, in response to the questions about what are the options, uh, I, I resist giving solutions because I don't think I think that has been the modus operandi uh, of uh, past efforts, the sort of like, this is what needs to happen, and people feel very strongly about what needs to happen and to benefit and, and, and what it looks like. So I, I, I resist that, and I, I, what I'm trying to offer here is more like a rethinking, a reimagination. Yesterday when Aurora Morales Levings, she, she, uh, uh, she, uh, uh, they talked, narrated this poem that she had written about um, what if, what if, and every line was what if we, and reimagination is really hard, right? Like we, we, are, we are socialized, we are, we're, we're productions of this whole enterprise, right? Of this colonial imperial enterprise. And so in going back to that paper, I'm, you know, we, and again, I say story hall, we cannot go back to the, uh, the you know, we, we cannot, you know, suddenly like um, flatten our landscape and put up huts, right? I mean, that's not where we are. We are here, but how might we rethink the way we approach this from a policy perspective, not from a everybody figure themselves out, because I think that gives way to the same sort of model of you know, survival of the fittest, rational action that dictates, um, has dictated where we are now, where market, where, um, uh, market, market balances itself out, or not, you know, rather not, but it's presumed to do that. So, um, with the, when I went up to that community, which has become this colorful, you know, thing which is being celebrated, I was disgruntled because I thought it was the effort of one artist who decided, architect artist who decided to approach the community and the government was not involved. So it, these efforts after the hurricane have been celebrated massively, like things like that, or people, you know, organizing a food, uh, 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 community food kitchen, or um, there are funds who are now going to different community organizations and saying we're going to give you money to to figure out housing here instead of you know uh, signaling the ineptitude of government in the whole production. So you have a little patchwork, you know, solutions that don't really address the fact that a community like that. Ha is disinhabited, and there are three people, right, or three families that are keeping it up, that are keeping it alive. The fact that some people lost their homes um, with, uh, in that community and could not return and weren't able to get FEMA support because they didn't have property titles. So that gets sort of painted over by this. So, so I mean, towards solution, I think it's rethinking land tenancy. Um, so not only construction, but what makes you um, an owner? Uh, and I, I, I think Puerto Rico, because there are about 55% uh, of the structures are informally built and have no titles, it's an opportunity to not say everybody is on their own and paint murals and, you know, how pretty, but to uh, redefine uh, what it means to own a home and also to redefine sort of some of the um, ideas of you know when you leave what is abandonment what is vacant and who it belongs to uh, so still very abstract but it's more of an inspiration to it to engage policy in that way Thank you. Uh, <laughs> as far as lunch logistics, do you want to share any additional details? Nope, lunch is available. Maybe. But if I recall, the booth can 